So the key word for this, this, this um, session is fun. So I would like it to be fun, but also what I, I'm concentrating on is in other people, in other communities, people talk about a functional pearl, something, a, a, a nice little piece of code, not, not perhaps something terribly challenging, but something that shows off the language or an approach to, um, to people who've perhaps not seen it before. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is using funds in Erlang to do some nice things. Um, because Erlang is a, is a functional language as well as being a concurrent, robust, whatever else language. Okay. The code for, that I'm going to use is up there on, on GitHub, so you can, you can get hold of the code that I'm, I'm going to demonstrate and show you. So I guess the, the, the basis, the first, the first starting point for what I'm going to say is that we can see functions as data. Um, and that's, you know, everybody knows that now. It's, it's true in JavaScript, it's true in Java even. Um, I'm not sure if there are first class functions in Fortran, but there probably will be soon. <laughs> so functions are first class citizens. In the, in the terminology from Christopher Strachey about 40 years ago, you can do everything with a function that you could do with other pieces of data. So you can pass it into other functions, you can um, return functions as a result of other functions, and so on. And it's something that we, we do, but perhaps we don't do as much as, as we might think of, even in programming quite simple things. So um, when I'm teaching this, the, the example, the simplest example I can think of um, for using a function as representing uh, something in a, in a problem space is to look at rock, paper, scissors. You know rock, paper, scissors. Two of you play. You both choose either rock or paper or scissors, and you determine the result that, that a rock will blunt a pair of scissors, scissors will cut a piece of paper, um, and so on. Where do functions come into this? Where they come in is the idea of a strategy. Because when you're playing rock, paper, scissors, perhaps you do, perhaps you don't, but if you want to, to model what rock, paper, scissors, how uh, you model, want to model the game, the first thing you think about is how your, your computer, I want to play rock, paper, scissors against the computer, I have to think about how it's going to play. And you can think there are various strategies for playing rock, paper, scissors. You can make a... a um, a choice, just at random. What sometimes people do is they echo the opponent's previous play. There are statistical approaches. You look at how many times your opponent has played rock or paper or scissors and try and make a judgment on the basis of that. One of the strategies I like the best is that people's perception of randomness is not quite as we understand it. So people will often, when they play rock, paper, scissors, not repeat the previous play, and so you can get an edge in playing it by assuming that your opponent won't repeat their previous move. But in each case, what we're doing is we're choosing what to play, the computer is choosing what to play, on the basis of the history of what the other person has played before. So what we have, we have a, a type for plays, and then a strategy is a function from a list of plays to a play. Give me the history of the plays for the, the opponent, um, and I will give you my next play. And you can see, for example, um, Echo, you might do this. I won't fall off the stage. To start with, when there's been no play at all, you make some random move. Otherwise, you, ch you choose the, the previous move of your opponent. I'm building the list up so that the most recent play is at the front. It just makes life easier. Um, as I say, this, this beat strategy is one where we look at the last play and we say, oh, if they played rock last time, let's assume they won't pay, play rock this time. So they'll either play paper or scissors. So if I choose scissors, I'll either draw with them or I'll beat them. So but the nice thing is that we're encapsulating that behavior in a function. And then we can... Here's a simple program which will play. You feed in a strategy and um, a history of the plays that have been played so far, and it will interactively um, 
play the game for you. So functions are useful in that sort of, um, in that sort of domain. We can use them for representing this active data. Um, and then, of course, once we've got functions as data, we can think of building functions that work over functions. So we can build what people often call combinators. We can take a number of strategies and mix them up together. Um, we could choose randomly between them. We could do a statistical analysis. We could look at the history of all the plays so far and see which strategy works best on those and then choose that one. Um, so once we're thinking of functions as active data, we can see that they we can start returning them as results of other functions and so on. So first lesson, the takeaway from this is it's a toy example. Um, but what we see is that functions are a useful piece of our armory as Erlang programmers. OK. Um, and if you're interested in this, there is httpworldrps.com, where you can find out more than you would imagine about rock, paper, scissors. There are tournaments. All sorts of things happen. Um, so it is one of the world's most horrible designed websites as well. <laughs> but hey. But you know, there's advanced RPS, there's a store, there's a society you can join. So you know, there's lots of stuff there. But it's, as an example, for me, it's one of the simplest examples where you can see the utility of taking a function and using that as a piece of data. OK. But let's do something a bit more serious. Um, let's think about the way evaluation works in Erlang. Um, what happens when we evaluate a function call? Oops, sorry. We first evaluate the arguments, and then we evaluate the function body. <coughs> so if we wanted to write a function that's a switch function, if you like, that if then else in Erlang, we could write it like this. So we're saying if n is positive, we return this answer, otherwise we return that. But the trouble is, in doing that, we will evaluate both alternatives. We'll evaluate whatever the positive alternative, we'll evaluate the number, whatever the, the positive alternative is, and then evaluate the negative before we do the case statement. So that's not terribly, that's not a terribly good way of writing an if then else. Um, and also, when we pass an argument in, we evaluate the whole thing. So if I write this function, it takes a list, I'm not sure why it does this, but it does. It takes the first two ele elements of the list and adds them together as the result. But if what we're doing is applying that, we'll have to evaluate the whole of the argument before we do the processing. So Erlang is eager in its evaluation. It means we evaluate all the arguments before we um, evaluate the body, and we evaluate them completely. Other languages do different things. <coughs> so Haskell does different things. Haskell's the main lazy language, but there are you know, laziness is available in a number of languages. How can we do it in Erlang? That's what I'm going to make the subject of the rest of the talk. And the key to doing it is um, to look at what happens when you pass a function as an argument in Erlang. When you pass a function, it's passed unevaluated. So if we want to wrap some stuff up and make it unevaluated, we stick it inside a function body. You see, the function takes no arguments, and it returns stuff. But instead of the stuff being evaluated, we, um, we just wrap it up in that closure. And then if we want to unwrap it, we want to get at the stuff, we apply the function, because that will then cause us to evaluate the body. So in a sense, the, the message for the rest of the talk is, is all in there. Wrap stuff up in a, in a closure, and then pull it out if you want to by applying it. OK, so how do we do that? This allows us to, do, to delay things. So we can build a lazy version of our switch. Oh, but it's looking a bit clunky, because now our switch is taking these wrapped up versions of the, the then part and the else part. 
Um, and so what we do here is we, the pulse and the neg now are functions from the empty tuple, functions of no arguments. If we get the answer true, we evaluate the positive part, and that's where the positive thing gets evaluated. Otherwise, we um, evaluate the negative. So we've managed to do that, but at some cost to our... Um, the type isn't as elegant, um, and we've, we've got to... Um, we've got to wrap up our original positive value as a, um, as a function. But there's another ingredient to Erlang that comes... Oh, and here we are. So if we wanted to do a lazy conditional, so we were switching on the value of 1 between the answer 7 and 1 divided by 0, um, this is how we do it. We don't pass in 7 and 1 divided by 0. We pass in these wrapped up these closures that contain 3 plus 4 and 1 divided by 0. So we've got our laziness. But what we've had to do is, instead of putting 3 plus 4 and 1 over 0, we've had to put that, um, that stuff there. Huh. But there is something comes to our rescue. Ha! Huh. We can define a macro. We can define the switch macro which will do that wrapping for us. So now we can say things like that. Switch between one, three plus, uh, switch between three plus four and one over zero. So now, now we have something that looks like a function. So we're sort of simulating, we're cheating really, but hey, you know, it's a nice, it's a nice way of doing it. So we hide the, we hide our wrapping up inside the, the definition of this switch macro. Where we, so we're calling our lazy switch, but we're doing the wrapping of the, of the stuff inside the macro. And of course, because this isn't function evaluation here, it's macro evaluation, we don't evaluate the arguments. So we've got that um, deferred evaluation. So now we can say lazy. Our lazy switch is there. OK, good. So that does it. I won't do a demo, you'll believe me. Um, in fact, the Erlang compiler is... is... Sorry? The Erlang compiler will remind you stuff. The Erlang compiler will give you a warning. And will something Well, it shouldn't. No, no. <laughs> no. Well, let me show you, it works. We, doesn't, we don't get an error when I evaluate this. We don't get an error, but it constructs the error. Fine. Well, if it constructs the error and I don't see it, I don't care. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> I don't care if, if it's, it's the error belongs to the compiler, not to my okay, application. It just happens to do this once of course stuff. Sure, exactly, yeah. Um, got some expression there. Precisely, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but the compiler gives me a warning. It says, you shouldn't have that there. I get my little green squiggly line, but, you know, I can live with that because I know better. Ha! <laughs> Fooled you, compiler. Right, okay. <laughs> So we've got, we've got this simple, I, I can show you a lazy switch. I can define if then else inside Erlang. But you might say, well, great, Simon, thank you for that. You've, you've wasted a quarter of an hour, an, an hour of my life to show me something I, that was in Erlang anyway. Let's do something a bit more interesting. Um, let's think about how we can define streams as um, inside Erlang. And the sorts of things I'm thinking about are... <coughs> streams that we construct, they're like lists, but they are, um, they're lazy. So I've got a cons function here that takes um, a head and a tail, and it wraps that up as a pair, x and x. And I've got functions um, to take the head and the tail of, of those things. So what I do to take the head is I, um, I take the list, I apply it, I unwrap it, to give me a pair, and then I just take the first half of the pair. To take the tail, I do the same thing, I apply it, and I get the tail, um, <coughs> the tail back. All very well. What's wrong with this? The first one is the evaluation the other one before making the function. Exactly. So what we need is a macro. So we're going to form our constructor function has to be a macro to avoid evaluating the arguments. Um, but if we do that, we can then start to build 
lazy lists. So for example, here is the, the infinite list of ones. <coughs> um, and you can see it as a sort of process network, if you wish. Um, what we're defining here is we're defining the ones, and what we're doing is feeding them back and appending one to the front of that list. So we're, we're building that, what looks like circular representation. Um, we can do other things. We can build the list of numbers starting at n. Numbers from n is cons of n on the front of n's, plus one, of n's from n plus 1. You can do that. We can do other things. We can build the infinite stream of primes. This is a sieve of Eratosthenes. It's perhaps not written in the most beautiful way, but what we do, we, to build the sieve, we, we start off with the list of all the numbers from 2. And then um, what do we do when we sieve a list? We take the head of that list and we remove from that list all the multiples of h, and then we sieve again. So we start off with a list beginning with 2. We return the 2 and then sieve all the numbers with the evens removed. So that will begin with 3. So that we'll then return 3 and sieve all the numbers, um, sieve all the multiples of 3 from there. And you can see what cut is doing is it's just removing all the multiples of. If h rem n is 0, h doesn't go into the answer, otherwise it does. So we're, we're building a sieve of Eratosthenes using, you know, using these, these, um, these streams. OK. Oh, and we could do fibs. And this is a nice one. We can say, how do you get the Fibonacci numbers? Well, you start off with 0, and then you have 1, and then you zip together by adding them together the whole list and the tail of the list. So you, um, and that's saying, that's adding the previous two numbers in the list together, if you like. So that gives us, again, an, a sort of process network we're getting here for those, um, for those lists. Uh, and so, you know, that's nice. I think it might say demo here. It does, uh, which is always a bad idea. But let's see what I can do. Um, so where are we? We're in stream.earl. Is that visible at the back? Or should I make it a bit? Should I make it bigger? OK. There? Is that, is that better? OK. So let's go into, oh, God. sorry. Let's go into Erlang. And then we can do stream. So this is, of course, these things are infinite, right? So we don't want to be printing infinite things at the screen. So I've got a little function that will only evaluate, say, the first 100 arguments, the first 100 values. Oh, whoops. Whoa, what am I doing? Pressing the wrong button. Um, let's say the first, we've got the, the stream of ones. Yeah, that's the first 100 ones. Good. Um, let's do, let's look at the fibs. So we've got a very nice description, what looks like, and I drew a picture with, with it feeding back. Um, but what we have not done here, unfortunately, is define something that's completely lazy. So I've failed in my, I've, I've built something which is non-strict in its evaluation, but I'm doing a heck of a lot of recomputation. So we could sit here for a while and we could watch, we, we might see one or two more, but you can see, you can guess that what's happening here is that each time I produce another item in this, I'm doing, I'm repeating the whole previous computation, probably twice. So not a good plan. Let's turn that off. Let's go back to my presentation. Okay. Um, so we've got streams that look infinite. We've got this nice way of describing things. 
they're apparently circular, but in fact they're not. What we're doing is just, we're setting up a very inefficient way of describing things. So what can we do? How are we going to get lazy evaluation? What we want to try and do is ensure each argument is evaluated at most once. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to do some memoization. And I'm going to show you two different techniques for doing that. Um, and I guess what's nice about the first one is it's an, it's, an, a, it's an idiomatic way of doing it. It plays to Erlang's strengths, but it's not completely pure. It uses some non-functional parts of Erlang. But I'll show you a second one, which is entirely pure, but a bit more um, involved. OK. I mean, shouldn't the compiler be doing memoization? Well, it's too. If we were writing a lazy language, if we were trying to, to implement the language differently, the compiler could do it. But it's difficult for it, the Erlang compiler to do that. It doesn't understand our intention. So what we're going to do is do some memoization. So we'll either use an ETS table, or we will um, model the store functionally. But we can see that we can do that in a way that is not going to be too, um, too intrusive on the way we write our, our computations. So let's just look at memoization. We can just use an ETS table, and it, we do the obvious thing. We can take a Fibonacci function, Fib of 0 is 0, Fib of 1 is 1, Fib of n is Fib of n minus 1 plus Fib of n minus 2, and we can memoize it. Um, I built a lookup table, and if there is a value in the lookup table, I use it. Otherwise, I actually do a bit of calculation. I add the two previous values and insert the result into the lookup table. So that gives me a way of, um, and this is entirely um, independent of uh, and you could almost, I'm not sure I'd want to say that, you could probably turn that into a macro if you were thinking hard about it. You have to be slightly careful. Macros, and it, once you get far enough into macros, you realize that they are not as um, elegant as you think. But yeah. <laughs> Because you can finish up with you can finish up with reassigning to variables and so on, because they don't handle variables in the way that we, we know and love them. But so you can push in a certain direction. You could perhaps turn that into a macro or do something clever around that, because it is entirely generic. There's nothing in here that's specific to this being Fibonacci. I look up a value, if it's not there, I do the calculation, stuff the result into the table, and return the result. Otherwise, I take the, uh, the value out of the table. So it's entirely, it's entirely generic. OK, so let's do that. Let's see how we can use ETS tables to, to give us these lazy streams. Um, so the answer is, and I suppose what we're doing here is we're doing a bit of explicit memory management. We're surfacing that. Um, and then we'll try and hide that as much as we can. How am I doing for time? So our ETS table is going to look like this. The things in it are either going to be a head and a tail, or they're going to be something that isn't evaluated yet. And we'll turn the things, as we, as we do com computation, we'll turn the things that aren't evaluated into things that are evaluated. And we're using the first slot to tell us the next free cell. So that's what the three is doing there. It's saying, if you want another place to put a bit of your list, use um, position three. So that's, what, that's the structure of our ETS table. Um, and here is our cons. So our cons has got a bit more complicated. Um, but it's still a macro. Uh, we update the next free reference. We put a thunk built up of the, the x and x's. So we've, we've hidden that inside um, a function. And we, um, we return the reference that contains that, that unevaluated function, that thunk. So we've created one of these, and we return the value 2 to say, it's stored at 2. Uh, so and that's where our, that constructing a list cell now does that. And now our, our functions that actually destruct the list will have to do some evaluation. They'll have to, do, they'll have to force things to happen. 
Um, and this is what happens here. This is where head will power the, um, the evaluation. So what happens here is if we have a, um, a thunk, when we look up the value, we extract the value from there, insert it into the table, take the head of the thing that was that value, and return it. So we, that gives us the head of the list. Um, and if once, when, when we visit that cell, we find there is something other than a thunk there, we just return the, we return the head. Um, so the head forces evaluation, the cons postpones it. So we've got this, this co-routine, really, between... And, this, and in a sense, my reply to Joe's question of what are the, the forgotten concepts in computer science was co-routines. Because if you do lazy programming, you get what you finish up doing often is having a number of functions which pass control between them according to demand for values in the, in the case of a list. You start pulling at the list um, and you co-routine between the function that is consuming the list and the, the, something, the thing that is producing the list. So it's quite a natural concept. Okay, so there we've got our head function and then we can write things like our ones list again. Um, and that is exactly the same as we wrote before, in fact. We've, we've improved what our cons function does, we've improved what our head function does, but it's all hidden behind, <coughs> hidden behind those macros. Oh, no, sorry. We've, we've, um, no, that was the old version. Apologies. Our new version is this. So we are explicitly now creating, if you like, what we're doing is pointer manipulation here. So we're saying, here is our, our, um, our ones list, and we create it by sticking one on the front of exactly that, um, that value. So we've had to do a tiny bit of, um, of pointer manipulation. But if you think of those things as these arrows I've drawn here, it's not too, it's not too unusual. And we can do, um, here is our, our fibs, and our new version of fibs will look something like this. Um, uh, oh, that's one. Oh, what's, I've done some, there's something peculiar here in my slide there. Uh, but this one, what I've got, this is our variant version of fibs. We create a new reference. We stick zero on the front of it, one on the front of it, and then the, we just add up the list itself and the tail of the list to give us the next value. And we should be able to see that in action. Um, so we've got explicitly managed reference, references. We're using impure features, but we've got a pretty clear transition from what we had there to what we have here. We're just naming the list, effectively naming the reference. This is the reference that thing will have. And we just use it explicitly there and there. So that's giving us, that's tying the knot for us. OK. Um, uh, should I do a demo? Yes. Just to show you. Uh, uh, what do I want to do? I want to go to here. And I've shut that down. So let's um, shut that down completely. Now, what have we got here? We've got lazy. Um, SS just gives us the, the, the values. And then we're doing lazy fib C. Um, and we're, let's uh, take 100. Uh, oh, yes, sorry. Of course, where's my look at, where's my, um, where is my, read the script. Is it set up or start? Set up, yeah. Okay, so set up. Sorry about this. Right, ah, oh. and now if I do that, I get the first hundred. Whoa, and let's do, whoa, that's perhaps one too many. There we are. Whoa, that's first hundred thousand. Ten minutes, okay, nine minutes. Okay, we might be there in, in. 
Um, but, you know, that's doing fine. That's giving us... And it, you can see that what we got, you know, relatively, um, relatively cheaply, using a mixture of funks, these suspensions, and macros. And really, macros are the crucial thing there. You can't, you can't write cons as a... Let's just stop that. Oh, stop. Oh, it won't stop. No, OK. It might stop at some point. In the, oh, dear. OK. But the downside of that, if you, if you want there to be a downside, is that um, we used ETS tables. So we didn't, in fact, um, we weren't entirely pure. We, um, we, we used, well, the impure features. Then, you know, what we did, we, we simulated the store. We simulated a bit of what was going on underneath in a language like Haskell at the, at the explicit level. But we can do better than that if we want to be pure. And what we can do instead of, um, instead of having a, uh, an external store, if you like, this big ETS table, we can thread a store through the function calls. Um, and this is what people who do Haskell programming do quite a lot of the time. And this is... It's one of the examples of what people um, do with monads, for example. So Haskell gives you a way of, of threading this, of giving you a syntax for doing that, threading the store through. Um. It's a bit more complicated here because, remember, we're suspending things as well. So there's, there's, there's implicit in what I'm going to say is quite a, compli I mean, a more complicated monad than just a state monad for those of you who are Haskell people. Um, oh, and sorry, this is just my printout function, which is not very interesting. In order to get this to work, I've had to change the representation slightly. If you remember what I was doing previously, I was putting the, the thunk around the head and tail. To get this to work properly now, what we're doing, in fact, I'm thunking just the tail. So I'm, I'm making it slightly less lazy. Um, but you don't really want lists where you could have potentially undefined elements. So it doesn't, in, in practice, it doesn't make a huge difference. And the thunk actually takes an argument. So we feed in, when we, when we unsuspend this tail computation, we feed in some state. So we can evaluate the suspended tail computation in the context of the current state. So having to do this, this um, threading through. And um, here's what cons looks like now, which is not too bad. Um, all that we're doing here is um, what are we returning? We update um, this is the, the, the reference we're returning and um, we're creating this thunk here with the X as the head and the thunk in the tail and we're, we're upgrading the, the point where um, yes, and that's it, in fact. We're just upgrading the, the store in a slightly different way. Sorry, the store is a map. Probably, yeah. So in fact, in here, we're not doing anything, anything terribly complicated. But f will be a function that takes a state. That's not apparent here, but it will be when we look at the head and the tail. So here's the cons. You just create the thunk, effectively. This is where it gets a bit more complicated. Um, so we've got three possibilities in here. It could be completely undefined. We could have a reference into our table, in which case we have to do something. We could have a thunk in there, in which case we pass in the store to f. That gives us a tail and a new store. And then we um, pass that. We update the store to create. Um, so the store is side affected by doing the, um, the tail computation. And then that side affected store gets updated with a reference to the new um, the head and tail. So we're doing this rather horrible threading. Pass in a store, get a new version of the store, and then update it with the new head and with the new tail. Um, and similar things in there. So this is really where things get a bit tricky. But you know, I think this is the point at which 
putting in some nice notation for monads in Erlang will give us precisely what we need. So I suppose the, the, the message that I was wanting to give from this, oh, and here's, here's the Fibonacci numbers, for example, using this, um, this calculation. And let me just show you, it does work. Um, let me find. So this is in, in, if you're looking at the code in, oh, and this did finally finish, that's good. Um, this is in, and so I will look in my, if we go into lazy three, sorry, this is not terribly imaginatively defined, but we can do lazy three show of now. And this now will be a fun um, lazy three, three colon fibs, C slash one. And if we show a hundred of those, that should give us, I hope, yeah. So there we're getting a hundred, let's do 10,000. There we're getting 10,000 using this explicit store. So it's an entirely um, pure functional calculation, and we got there, um, that's given us that completely lazy stream version of Fibonacci. So what is the take home from all of this? But, but just a moment. So yes. one now has lost 30,000. I'm sorry? This doesn't do memorization, really. It has lost 30,000. Sure. But it's, it's, you're passing them through as a, as a map. So as an explicit map goes through, and that collects the, the results that you need. Yeah, and now I've just printed them out. Yeah. So it's entirely, there is nothing has been side affected. It's an entirely functional calculation. Yeah, so I'm just saying, you can do it that way, you can do it with an X table, you can do whatever you want. The memoization is there when you need it, but we're, we're, it's, not, it's not side affected the world. So it's just, it's, I'm saying there are two approaches. You can be, use an X table, use this, which doesn't, which uses a map that you thread through and lose. Do whatever you want. Um, so to conclude, I mean, you know this, but it's quite nice to have done a, a demonstration of it. There are flexible and powerful modeling tool. We can model strategies, for example, in rock, paper, scissors using functions. Um, but pure modeling of effects is not straightforward. So this is where some of this stuff in the Haskell, and, and you see it in OCaml, so people use this idea of, of um, trying to structure put some structure above these, these computations that are explicitly thread through a state. And as I say, this is, this is made more complicated by the fact that we were having to pass those bits of state into the suspended um, computations. Um, so there are some useful patterns out there that people use to, d to describe this sort of computation. Um, I mean, you can also think of, of reifying this and building little languages for strategies that you compile into, into functions. So you know, again, the, the world of DSLs is often a world where you build a representation of some functional data, and then you compile it or transform it into, um, into a functional representation. Um, and you know, I think it's interesting. This is all stuff. There's nothing new in this. It's stuff people understood 30 years ago. Um, but it, it's... It's something that people don't always realize, and it's worth revisiting every 10 years or so. Um, I mean, I think, and, and in, perhaps not in the Erlang world, but in, in other places, people have invented more complicated types to try and encapsulate some of the things that are going on in doing those sorts of calculations. So I think that was, um, this is where it sits um, on GitHub, and you know, I hope you had some fun. Okay. Uh, well, let, let oh, me there's one at the back. Question. Yeah. Is there something you could, I mean, what, what would we add to Erlang to, to make this a little bit less clumsier? Could we do it with a parse transform or could we continue to use terrible macros? Like, is it I think this may be much better in Elixir. I haven't tried it in Elixir. So I think parse trans I'm, I'm not a fan of parse transforms, well, really. What's the oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what was the question? The question was, should we do this with parse transforms? Um, should we try and put some support into the, into the compiler for doing this kind of thing? Um, I think 
I'm not a fan of path transforms myself, because I think you're losing. I, I think the, the structure of the code should represent what the code is intended to do. I think if you then, if you transform it in that sort of way, it's much harder to, to, to get an understanding of what's going on. You could say that using macros at all is, um, is doing that to some extent. Erlang could have a more complicated macro system. That would, that I had, there were some places where um, I had to tune some of the macro definitions. There was another approach I did that failed that you can find in that repo because of the variable handling inside the macro definition. So it, it would be possible for Erlang to have a better macro system. On the other hand, you know, I think macros fit well with this, but whether you want to have a language where macros are there pervasively is another, is another question. Because they, 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 throw, they get rid of type information, for example. Um, I mean, there are languages where you can do, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a big can of worms, language design. And I, I suppose what, I'm trying to, what I was trying to do here was show you can take a few features of Erlang, like ETS tables and macros and the fact that you've got functions as first-class citizens, and put those together and do this nice, this nice piece of work. But tinkering wholesale with the, with the, the language, I think, is something you do at your, your peril. Now, I don't know how this works in Elixir, and I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who's got more experience of that and would like to comment. I'd be interested, I'd be interested to know. Okay. Either and afterwards or, or, yeah, anyway, okay. Uh, I have a, a question. The, uh, uh, it seems that either through the pure or impure method, you're accumulating the, the memoization of what, what every lazy computation that you've done. Mm. That's a good question. You, couldn't, you shouldn't represent them as maps or ETS tables if you're doing that. Uh, good point. Um, I mean, for something like primes, you, you need to, your footprint is going to get bigger and bigger. Um, but you're right. I mean, you can, if you know more about the, the, the way it's being consumed. That's true. Yes, good question. Okay, thank you.